Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And today is the podcast for October 2nd, 2022. Uh, we're talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. So we're in Exodus chapter 14. Uh, we've suggested uh, various verses here. Uh, it's a rather, well, you're welcome, of course, to read the whole chapter, but uh, or to add or delete verses, but we're saying 5 through 7, 10 through 14, and 21 through 29. Uh, now, of course, we're skipping a lot. Uh, we, we touch on a number of these other stories or talk, uh, read a number of these other stories in other years of the narrative lectionary, but for this year, we're skipping from the story of Joseph in Potiphar's house and then in prison uh, to the story of the Exodus. So uh, you will, of course, as usual, want to fill in the gaps a bit. Uh, you can, I think, assume that if, you're, uh, if your congregation knows any story in Exodus, they're going to know the story of, uh, of, of the, the, the Exodus from Egypt, uh, including the crossing of the Red Sea, but you might talk about the connection between the Joseph story and this story being that, of course, in chapter one of Exodus, it says that there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. So uh, the, the Israelites, uh, the, the family of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, uh, end up in Egypt uh, in, a, in a very positive light uh, the, uh, with one of their own as second in command, but eventually they uh, become enslaved in Egypt. Uh, and so you'll uh, you'll remind folks of that. Uh, and then here's really uh, probably the, the climax of the story where they finally make that break completely from Egypt where they cross the Red Sea or the Reed Sea uh, and the Egyptian army is destroyed behind them. So I wanna um, jump right to um, one of the problems that people have with this story. And that is got the violence of God. So, um, and I want to quote, um, and then this will get us into the question of sort of liberation theological readings of the Exodus story. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. wrote in the letter from a Birmingham jail, freedom is never given voluntarily by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And I think that really is uh, a great commentary on this story. And uh, again, human nature reminder from the flood story that after the flood story, the hearts of humanities were not like, uh, the human condition had not changed. And you right. see that here in how desperately the, the empire here wants to cling to its power over its slaves. Uh, the big irony, of course, uh, Joseph was sold as a slave, then he rose to second command, but then the generations go and now the people are slaves, the entire people. And this is a story about God's commitment to freeing slaves. And yeah, I just want to stop there for now. Yeah, and, and we would refer you, of course, uh, like every week to the uh, the written commentary on this text, this this week by Erica Dunbar, a professor from Baylor University, who talks about uh, this liberating God uh, and the and the, um, the the fact that that God is for those who are oppressed and freeing those who are oppressed. This, of course, has been a, a very important story for lots of people over the centuries. Really, uh, um, you mentioned MLK, of course, the the civil rights movement. Uh, even earlier than Martin Luther King, of course, uh, Harriet Tubman. Uh, who uh, uh, Professor Dunbar mentions as well, uh, Harriet Tubman as uh, a kind of second Moses or, or another Moses who frees her people uh, from being enslaved, uh, and uh, liberation theologians uh, in the uh, in Latin America. This has been a very important story for them, uh, and it makes a strong claim that God is has the preferential option for the poor, right? That God cares about those who are oppressed, uh, that God fights for them against the empire, right? Uh, and and um, the empire here is Egypt, but we can think of a lot of other empires, including um, uh, 
um, perhaps even uh, the United States at times, but uh, but others uh, that have have held power over other people in a way that is uh, that does not have those people's best interests at heart. We think of empires too, or despots like uh, I think of Kim Jong Un in North Korea or. Uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia or uh, Assad of Syria. Uh, there's this very poignant um, verse, I think it's in chapter nine or 10, where Pharaoh's officials say to him, do you not yet understand that Egypt is destroyed? Right? Uh, and, and he doesn't, he, he's grasping onto power. Pharaoh is grasping onto power, even though his own land, his own people are being destroyed. This is the kind of death, and unfortunately we see that in despots, uh, some of whom I just named uh, like uh, Assad in Syria. Uh, despots who desperately hold on to power uh, in, in spite of the fact that they're destroying their own people uh, by doing so. This is who God is fighting against. This is who God is, uh, is punishing, uh, is, uh, it, is defeating uh, for the sake of the downtrodden, for the sake of the of those who are enslaved. I think there's many directions a preacher could obviously go. Uh, you and I being committed to this, a, a certain theological reading that emphasizes God's faithfulness and commitment and God keeping of prom God's keeping of promises. Uh, I always will come back there. But one direction somebody might go, maybe in a sermon, but for sure I would hope in conversations, is to remind people that slavery is not over. Um, in, in our country, you know, um, slavery didn't end in 1865. It continued in different things. There's, a, there's actually, according to some estimates, there's more slaves in the world today than there were in the mid-19th century. Um, mm. And there's lots of types of slavery uh, in the world today sexual trafficking, slavery, wage slavery, child labor, um, entire populations in China, you know, uh, being enslaved. Um, so slavery is not a thing of the past. Uh, so one of the things, if we read a Psalm that says God, you know, frees the slaves, we, we might wonder where God's spirit right now is stirring to free slaves in a similar way to this, that the, the intrusive grace of God to break these structures of oppression um, isn't over, it's ongoing um, throughout the world. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make, whether, as you say, whether in a sermon or in conversation. Uh, I, I, uh, I love the, um, what I've heard in uh, African-American interpretation of this story, this phrase that God makes a way where there is no way. Yeah. Right? That this, uh, this is, uh, this certainly can be a text. You can talk about uh, modern day slavery. You can talk about uh, historical fights uh, for um, for justice uh, and to defeat oppression. You you might talk about it in a more personal way too. Uh, I've heard a beautiful. Uh, I'm thinking of one particular sermon on this from a student actually, who used this text to talk about addiction. That, that God makes a way where there is no way, that where we don't see a way forward, God can make a way. God can make a way through the sea uh, so that we can emerge from death to life. Uh, there's, there's a myriad of ways that you could approach this story. Uh, that's, that's one way that I found particularly moving, but uh, to make it more personal and talk about those obstacles, those things that stand in, a, uh, stand in the way of us experiencing the full life that God wants us to have the abundant life that Jesus promises. Uh, and, and addiction is one of those things that, uh, things that seem difficult to us, things that may even seem impossible to us, uh, God can make a way where there does not appear to us to be a way forward. So uh, thank you for that. I mean, there are, there are ways that we can apply the story to our own lives like that, that are really valuable also. And spiritual ways. I, I want to talk about one funny part of the story. Um, to me, um, the last couple of weeks, Catherine, uh, with your uh, background and your Jewish teachers, you've talked about the rabbis at, at different times. So sometimes with the recording on, sometimes I think with it off. But there's a uh, Exodus 14, 15 bothered some of the rabbis. because so here they are. Um, Moses cries out to God. And then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Um, 
tell the people of Israel to go forward. So the question is, why would God say to Moses, don't cry out to me? Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes the rabbis are just being funny. I mean, that's yeah, the great thing. Yeah, yeah. And one of the rabbis said, ah, uh -huh, there is a time for long prayers and there is a time for short prayers. This is a time for short prayers. Moses was praying a long prayer. So, <laughs> and I, it's uh, my teacher, Don Jewell, uh, is how I know some of the rabbinic commentary. And he, that was his favorite um, Pesher or, uh, you know, um, the biblical text. That's funny. Just, it's not, it's not inherently important to the story, uh, yeah. but it's, to me, it's a, it's a, sometimes humor to get into a difficult story is a tactic I use. I, I remember the first Seder that I ever went to. It was my, <laughs> my um, teacher, John Levinson, who's of course an Orthodox Jew, wonderful scholar. Uh, and, uh, we went and we had, of course, the traditional, I think it's four cups of wine over the course of the night, though I moved to grape juice because I had to drive home. <laughs> but I remember there's at one point uh, after this story is told, is retold at the Seder, um, you take your, uh, your spoon and you dip it into your cup of wine and you put 10 uh, drops onto the uh, plate in front of you. And that's to uh, symbolize to wine. If, if wine symbolizes joy and festivity, then the diminishment of wine uh, symbolizes the kind of diminishment of joy. And, uh, and the point is that even in the midst of celebration, even in the midst of thanking God for God's uh, redeeming work, we remember those people who suffered uh, in, in the midst of it. So the Egyptians who suffered through the 10 plagues and the Egyptians who died in the Red Sea, right? They're, they're suffering, uh, even though uh, through it, God works a miracle. Uh, their suffering is still acknowledged in the Seder. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I just find that beautiful, that uh, even, yeah, even in the midst of celebrating God's liberating power, uh, thought is given to the enemy. You know?